Centre that is based here at the University of Buckingham. And welcome to the IATP's official launch. Before we dive into tonight's event, uh, and I introduce our esteemed panel, all of whom are actually on the IATP's advisory council, let me first just run over some housekeeping. We are hosting tonight's event on two platforms, Zoom and YouTube. Uh, during the Q&A session, you have the opportunity, if you are on Zoom, to put your questions in the Q&A box and you have the ability to upvote them. Uh, if you're feeling a bit shy tonight, you can ask anonymously. And if you are on YouTube, uh, feel free to use the chat function and I'll see if some of the questions can get to me over here and I'll try my best to answer some of them. So now that's out of the way, let's get to it. Today is a very special day for me. The IATP is something I've been thinking about and planning for a very long time. And it's a pleasure to finally unravel it to you all this evening. The mission of the IATP is to champion African free market solutions for increased prosperity by helping to support those on the ground who are in the best position to make a change. We're launching this initiative right now because the future of African trade really is at a crossroads. The African continental free trade area, which was formally implemented just five months ago, has pledged to remove 97% of tariffs on all goods traded between member states within 13 years. The World Bank has predicted that if it's fully implemented and fully liberalized, it could lift about 30 million Africans out of extreme poverty Within, half, within a couple of decades, add half a trillion to the continent's economy and boost wages for nearly all workers uh, by about 10 percentage. However, many problems remain. There are delays in implementation, a long timeline for tariff reduction, ever increasing calls for post-COVID economic nationalism. And there are concerns that some nations have actually just ratified the area to get their feet under the negotiation table, probably the prime example being Nigeria, the biggest economy on the continent. However, we'll dive into all these details and more, as well as introduce our esteemed panel in just one moment. But before all that, I would like to, as if this was a real in-person launch, turn over to Professor James Tooley, the Vice-Chancellor at the University of Buckingham, as I said, where we are based, um, just for a couple of minutes of opening remarks. So Professor James Tooley, over to you. Thank you, Alex. So I, I am, as Alex said, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, and it's my deep pleasure to be with you all tonight for the launch of the Initiative for African Trade and Prosperity. I'm really thrilled that this project has been set up at the University of Buckingham in collaboration with the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. Our university is a very special university and this is a very special project to us and to me in particular. The University of Buckingham has had a long association with Africa. First, this is in terms of students. We've educated thousands of young people from Africa many of whom gone to be entrepreneurs, academics, politicians, and think tank leaders too. And representing Buckingham African alumni this evening is Franklin Kujo, the Ghanaian president of the Amani Center for Policy and Education based in Accra, Ghana. He was an Erhard doctoral fellow at the University of Buckingham until recently, I believe. And second, that's through teaching, also through research and development. And I can give as one example, my own work on low cost private education, which actually fits in quite neatly with the, the mission of this new center. Um, I've been working in Africa, taking in countries such as Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Somalia. So I'm very excited to announce this new initiative and also to welcome Alex Hammond as the leader of this new initiative. I've followed his progress over the nearly two years that I've known him. He's one of the rising stars of the university and a key figure in the Vincent Center for the Public Understanding of Economics and Entrepreneurship. So the Initiative for African Trade and Prosperity is guided by the belief that bottom up free market policies are the most effective way to alleviate poverty, 
amplify individual liberty and create a more prosperous and peaceful future. One of the things that I think is special about the initiative and which perhaps differentiates it from other free market think tank initiatives working with Africa is its explicit aim to partner with local groups and think tanks to help make their voices that push for greater freedom more effective and louder. As Alex mentions, the opportunities of the new free trade area are vast, but realistically, the only way that we'll, we'll succeed is, is if the voices of local actors are heard loud and clear. So for all these reasons and more, it's my pleasure to welcome the Initiative for African Trade and Prosperity to the University of Buckingham. I'm pleased to have been invited to speak at this official launch, but let's not let me hold you up anymore, Alex. On with the show. Thank you, James. It truly means a lot. So now to introduce our three panelists. Tonight, we are joined by Douglas Carswell. Douglas is the president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. He was an MP for 12 years, and it's no stretch to say that Douglas is one of, if not the most influential MP of the last decade. He also co-founded Vote Leave, the campaign that won the Brexit referendum. He is the author of several books. He serves as the non-executive director at the Department for International Trade. He is on the advisory council of the Institute of Economic Affairs. I think you can see the logo just up there. Um, the list of achievements go on and on. Uh, we could spend almost my entire event talking about Douglas's resume. Um, but one fact about Douglas many don't know, he was actually raised in Kampala, Uganda. Douglas, how are things stateside? It's wonderful being over here. I'm, uh, it's, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's, um, I'm having a great time here in America. Um, the argument in favour of freedom and liberty is universal, so it's great to be here. Glad to hear, good stuff. Uh, next up, we've got Ibrahim Enoba. Ibrahim is one of my favourite African historians. He is a fellow for the Centre for African Prosperity at the Atlas Network and editor of AfricanLiberty.org, which is a brilliant initiative that you should all check out after this webinar. And of course, after you've uh, looked at the IATP website first, um, he is an expert in African political economy and history. And as such, his works have appeared in prominent publications all across the US and Africa. Ibrahim, welcome, how are things? Thank you, Alex. It's my great pleasure to, to be here and to have uh, the opportunity of uh, participating in this very important initiative. And hopefully we can have uh, a very promising discussion. Thanks, Ibrahim. And finally, but last but by no means least, we are joined by Franklin Kujo. Uh, Franklin is the founding president and CEO of Imani Ghana, one of Africa's largest and most prominent free market think tanks. Franklin has written for all the big publications. He has consulted former UK prime ministers on how to make British aid more effective. And in 2012, he was the only think tank leader named on Africa Report's top 50 Africans. Franklin, thank you for joining us. I've been told your Wi-Fi is a bit shaky. Is, is it all good now or? Hi, well, um, good afternoon or good evening it is. Um, thank you, Alex, and thanks for having me. Um, I hope my Wi-Fi is stable. Um, the internet has been a bit uh, slow these days, but let's hope it keeps us all engaged. Good stuff. We can hear you loud and clear for now. So let's kick things off. I sh as I mentioned at the beginning, all three panelists tonight are on the advisory board for the IATP. Um, but to start off with, I think it would be wrong not to start with the African continental free trade area. It was implemented in January, 1st of January 2021. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, it is expected to lift about 30 million people out of extreme poverty, 68 million out of moderate poverty. Uh, and just boost trade by billions and billions, I, I could go on. So Ibrahim, I'll come to you first. There are many, many optimistic predictions about the free trade area, uh, but do you think these predictions are actually justified or rather they just long shot hopes by analysts at the World Bank and the UN who hope this is how things will be? What are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, 
the likes of the World Bank and the United Nations, they, they have the right to be very hopeful about uh, the future, the, the economic future of Africa, considering the fact that it's, it's the World Bank and the IMF that have put Africa in, in to a large extent, the uh, economic or budget mess it has found itself in the last um, few decades. So, so they have the right to be hopeful for the continent, but in actual terms, I think if uh, this agreement is implemented according to what we have on paper or what, what we've been told by uh, the headquarters in Accra, uh, there can't be any denial of the, the, the imminent reality that's upon Africa. And that is uh, the, ex the explosion of the economic opportunities that are bound on the continent. This is the continent that has the, the largest economic opportunities buried by numerous layers and layers of, 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 of uh, regulations, tax regulations, uh, business regulations. And I, and I really think that uh, it, it has enormous potential of unleashing any of these um, opportunities. Say for instance, if uh, the doing business uh, um, sector or the, the doing business uh, approaches are treated differently by just consider the likes of Nigeria and South Africa alone. Say for instance, they removed the barriers uh, that we currently have on young entrepreneurs who are trying to have businesses. For instance, in Nigeria, if you wanna start a business as a young person, you go through more um, turmoil and layers of, of inspection than say Dan Gote. Uh, so say for instance, you remove that one regulatory barrier. Nigeria has the largest denomination of youth in West Africa, I think. See what that's gonna unleash. It's gonna unleash enormous uh, self uh, proprietors, entrepreneurs. So of course, I think these predictions as uh, the, the, the coatings of uh, actuality, it all depends on implementation. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, I think Nigeria is an interesting case because they ratified the free trade area, African continental free trade area, very last minute in December, 2020. Um, However, for most of the last three years, they've had their border closed with their neighboring countries, Niger, uh, Cameroon, Benin, uh, I think there's one over I'm missing. Um, so it's interesting we've signed up, but if I signed up to a free trade area, but if you get closed their borders and it's still only a partial reopening has occurred. Uh, Franklin, coming to you next, what do you think of the biggest barriers that remain in African trade? Is it harmonization, corruption, infrastructure? Uh, what, what would you say is the biggest? Well, first of all, I think policy, uh, uh, should I call it um, alignment, really, um, in terms of each country's own institutional setup when it comes to taxes, when it comes to regulations in general, and when it comes to um, services uh, from the banking sector to basically how things are organized in each country. I guess that is the biggest barrier. Um, the other day we had an event on the free trade area and um, some of the practitioners were the view that the institutional setup for effective trade within Africa ought to be the things that should engage everyone. And indeed the bankers for instance were saying that there was a need to have a good in, uh, international settlement platform to encourage the seamless opportunities to trade. There were others who believe that clearly speaking, we needed much more information as to what services would have to be traded in. I mean, services that have comparative advantage for each country. I think it's important to have a catalog that explains to various actors within each country what they are actually facing or what they are up to, even though it's supposed to be a free trade area. Then of course, there's also the fact that the whole idea of um, ensuring infrastructure uh, reform, as in making sure that Nigeria pretty much has good roads really, but there are challenges with most African countries when it comes to trading uh, across borders using roads. And I think these and many other factors uh, would have to be on, on, on F or probably understood before we even start talking about the gains from the deal. And of course, as you know, 
some countries have just signed up. They are yet to ratify. Uh, after ratifying, you need to deposit your instruments of ratification. Uh, not many have done that at all. So there's still a long way to go when it comes to the whole idea of uh, the. I mean, trying to navigate the the the, the choppy waters of encouraging or ensuring free trade within the continent. Yeah, absolutely. Of for the free trade area of those who have signed it of the 55 African Union states, 54 have signed, but only 36 have ratified. And I think it's about 34 have fully ratified, but 36 because they're depositing their instruments of ratification now. Um, Douglas, you've written extensively about the benefits of free trade and an open society. But how can, why do you think that it's taken African leaders so long to form this free trade area? Why didn't this happen back in the 70s, 80s? Why, why is it taken to 2021? Well, first of all, um, Alexander, if I can say very well done to you and to the IEA and to Franklin and Ibrahim and your team um, and um, to Professor Tooley for um, launching this initiative. I, I think this is an incredibly important initiative, not only for the future prosperity of Africa, I think actually for the global prosperity of humankind. I think this is really, really essential. Um, free trade is the engine of, of human progress. It is the thing that allows us to escape from our natural condition of, of grinding poverty. Now, I, I grew up in Uganda in the 1970s and the 1980s, and the country I grew up in was dirt poor. It was incredibly poor. It was common to see children with kwashiako and, and, and you know, very, very dirt poor uh, standard of living. Um, and it had closed borders. It was a country that had price controls and it was a country that had state monopolies. Since Uganda has removed many of those restrictions, it has had 25 years of the most remarkable growth. Um, you've had 6% growth per year compound. You have seen the emergence of a prosperous Ugandan middle class, and it is a shining example of what is possible. But think of what could be done if the whole of the African continent liberalized fully Uganda hasn't liberalized fully. Think of, think of the prosperity and the wealth that could be created in, 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 in future. Now, I think the single biggest inhibitor is the restrictions that are placed on Africans moving goods and services across borders in Africa. Vested interests, whether it's a border official who wants a bribe or a government department that wants a permit or vested interest in the form of a local producer who doesn't want cheap competition. There are lots and lots of vested interests that want to prevent the free movement of goods and services across borders in Africa. And if we can make the argument, the moral argument, that actually Africa could become incredibly prosperous if we remove those restrictions, and if we keep hammering away at this point, I think we can win this argument. Look, if we had been having this conversation about Asia in the mid 20th century, people would have pointed out the fact that Asia was poor. And then you saw the emergence in the mid 20th century of Singapore and Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan and, and South Korea, the, the, the small Asian societies that opened themselves up to free trade and took off as a result. Then came the Asian giants, China in the 1980s, India in the 1990s, Indonesia in the early noughties. Now it's Africa's turn. If we can do what those Asian countries did, which is to open themselves up to capital ideas and competition. And that means facing down the vested interests, but making the moral argument in favor of, of free trade. And I think we can do that. I think there are many, many Africans today that will benefit from that, but we need to be prepared as in all countries, as in Britain today, where we're debating about free trade, we have to be prepared to take on the vested interests who prefer parasitic protectionism. And we, we have to be prepared to argue against them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And thank you very much for your kind words about the IATP. It means a lot to have you and everyone else on board and especially with us tonight. Uh, for everyone in the audience, be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get onto them in a few minutes time. Uh, Ibrahim, I wondered if you could comment on this. So Africa's now put in, uh, African leaders have now put forward this free trade area. But do you think that the turn many African states towards socialism, 
post-independent post-independence uh, played a role in the delay of a continent-wide free trade area because that's what you would think you'd think african states turn towards socialism post-independence therefore that's why there's been a delay in the free trade area or do you think in a way that because a lot of these back in the 1960s and 70s the pan-african which is like the socialist ideals of united socialist africa ideas actually helped fuel the development of the free trade area because today we see quite a few leaders supporting the free trade area because they think you know, it links back to uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who's the first leader of an independent Ghana, his vision of a united socialist, in a way, Africa, even though it's through free trade. What do you think? Did one cause the other? Or Well, it's, it's a very important uh, uh, point you're trying to raise. And I, I would love for everybody to actually, first of all, understand or appreciate, regardless of our bias, that the whole idea of economic unification of Africa, free trade, no barriers to trade in the modern, or you wanna say post-colonial Africa, was actually championed by Kwame Nkrumah. And more particularly, I think at the 1958 conference called uh, all, in, all African Independent State or All Independent African State Conference in Accra, 1958. And Nkrumah in his message to uh, the African nationalists and, and, uh, and uh, political parties uh, very mentally argued that the only way Africa can, you know, do away with the um, agenda of the imperialist or the so-called colonialist uh, was for it to not only political unify politically unified, which of course uh, comes to the socialist idea of political unification, but also economically unified, which starts with free trade. Of course, a lot of people didn't buy it then. And uh, eventually in 1963, um, the majority of the continent went with um, Haile Selassie's proposal for a much more liberalized, loose union, which uh, you know created an economic forum within the African, the organization of African unity now known as African Union itself. But here is where it become problematic. So ever since the African Union have always had this oversee, overseen or overseer uh, role, as regards how much African African um, countries economically integrated with, with one another, 696 It's I think it's by 2021, it's, it should have been more than 50 years ever since. Uh, and guess what? Africa is still not economically integrated as it should be. Africa currently trade more outside with outsiders than it does within, yeah. it, within itself. So why then, as this whole economic integration plan pushed by Nkrumah, um, supported by Selassie and other Nigeria, uh, you know, uh, other liberal post-independent African leaders, a lot of them in Nigeria and Liberia, uh, why is it not materialized? Why, why do we actually need the, the uh, African continental free trade area in the 2020s? It means the uh, the idea that was created in 1963 house in the African Union never really achieved its its aim, which is of course is the, is the reason why we have this AFCFTA. But this is how it become much problematic. So I recently learned that the um, the AFCA headquarters in Accra, uh, inspired by um, Nanaku Fuado, handed the AFCFTA over to the African Union. And that's where it become problematic for me. So why can't the AFCFTA operate as an independent consortium or more of like, more like, more of a, more of something like the World Trade Organization, rather than say you want to handle the AFCFTA over to the African Union. It's the same dormant organization that have, uh, that have, you know, failed largely so much that we actually need the FCFTA. And actually, we finally have the FCFTA. And the only thing we want to do is actually give it back to the African Union. So that's where it becomes problematic. Why do we need the African Union to, to monitor countries or to ensure that countries live up to their um, expected, expected uh, commitments? Mm -hmm. So that's primarily my own worry. So first of all, we shouldn't forget that this, of course, ironically came from a socialist. You might want to describe him like that, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, but also because uh, we, we actually need to ask a question of why is this house in the African Union at this point? Yeah, no, that's a great point that Nkrumah, the early African uh, 
leader of socialism in a way and pushed African socialism on the continent, wanted free trade. And that was actually the case with a lot of early socialists. However, there's them a question as if they wanted free trade because they would believe it would uh, quicken up the socialist, the inevitable socialist workers' revolution. Um, but with free trade, I think, it, especially for socialists, it's great to have, but there's no point in having free trade if you then don't have other things like property rights. If you don't have the incentive to produce, create, uh, risk something in order to get a reward, you're not. there's no benefit of free trade in the first place. Um, so Douglas, I'd like to come to you. What do you think is the best way in which we, you can give me some advice as I'm setting up the IATP and I'll, then I'll come to Franklin with the same question. What is the best way that we can communicate with local actors about the benefits of free trade, especially when economic nationalist, the economic nationalist case is so easy to understand, even though it's wrong, uh, and free trade is qu quite counterintuitive. A couple of years ago, I was involved in a free trade conference organized in Uganda to promote the argument in, in favor of free trade. And I came across exactly this. It's, it's quite counterintuitive in, in any culture and any continent this idea that actually cheap imports make your country richer by elevating your living standard. Um, and it's, it's not an argument that we're born understanding. We, each of us needs to have the basic argument explained to us. But I, I actually think, and this is an argument that conservatives around the world, I, I think, um, could, 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 could understand. We, we, we've not been very good at making the argument. Um, but we, we ought to be. Because think about it, I've got, I've got with me my, my smartphone. Um, smartphones are now affordable to pretty much anyone for a few hundred dollars, whether you're a, uh, someone in Kampala or, or, or Clacton in England, you can pretty much, anyone who wants to can now afford a mobile phone. I would have thought it'd be fairly easy to make the case to people that that device that gives people for a few hundred dollars more computing power than NASA had the year they landed a man on the moon, that, that, that miracle of modern technology is a consequence of free trade and specialization and exchange. There's, there's no country in the world that would be able to produce a device like this at the cost that we get it from. This, this is designed in California using chips from Japan and software from India. It's assembled using plastic um, um, extracted from, from oil wells in the Gulf. It's, it's a creation of a global supply chain. And it's that global interdependence and the uh, uh, ease with which we can import things from around the world that makes us rich. It's a difficult argument to make, but I, I think we, we, we need to make it. Um, a generation ago, Milton Friedman made that argument very, very convincingly using different metaphors and different tools to an audience of middle-class Brits and Americans through a TV series called Free to Choose. I think we need to think in terms of a similar initiative. How do we reach those tens of millions of educated, middle-class, increasingly aspirational Africans who you know, are going to want to make sure that their children are better off than they are. How do we articulate and make the argument to them um, that free trade is, is the way to do it? I mean, it's a pretty important thing for, you know, according to some current projections, the population of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, that's one city in Tanzania, will be larger than that of the whole of France at the end of this century. Now, the only way we're gonna make sure that people in Dar es Salaam have a higher standard of living than they have today is if a country like Tanzania embraces free trade. So it's a pretty profoundly important argument to make, but we need to make sure that it's an argument made by Africa for Africans and it's owned by that rising African middle class. It's, it's, it's the same, question that Friedman and co faced 40 years ago. How do, you, how do you popularize the moral case for free trade? It's a difficult one, but it's absolutely imperative that we, we begin to make it. I couldn't agree with you more. And Franklin, what, what, what would you say to that? A quite a common complaint I've had um, from African politicians, especially, is when I talk about free trade and removing tariffs, they say, no, but you don't understand. We raise a lot of government revenue through tariffs. What would you say to that opposition? Well, first of all, you've got to reach people with reason arguments. I mean, this argument about raising revenues through tariffs 
can also be explained away that um, there's an opportunity cost there. I mean, if you reduce tariffs, what it means is that it constitutes or it, it converts into savings for the uh, the ordinary consumer, really. Um, I guess there's one strand, which is the time and advice given to um, thinkers by some of our forebearers when it comes to how to convert people's minds to believe in the power of ideas, especially free market ideas. And that's to reach out to the journalists, to reach out to students, to reach out to the academia with reason arguments. I would also think that we need to show them examples of what works elsewhere. A couple of months ago, um, I received a request from a senior government person who was taxed to come up with a Ghana Beyond Aid Charter. And the charter essentially is to say that Ghana as well as South African countries were tired of aid and they needed to chart a new path. Well, his instructions to me were straightforward. I was supposed to come up with reasons why the likes of Singapore, South Korea, uh, Malaysia, who were peers at independence, uh, had done relatively better than us. And instead of responding with loads of uh, explanations, I just listed a number of economic indices that I know, including the ones we are used to or the ones we know, the economic freedom houses, the, of course, the Cato Institute's um, Heritage Foundation, indeed all the economic indices that we, we know of, including the World Economic Forum, and even those of the habits of highly effective countries. Uh, I think the Free Market Foundation is the one that uh, champions that. And then I pointed out to the senior officer to look at all these countries he wants me to, he wants Ghana to be compared with and ask or read up why these countries are doing relatively better than Ghana. And there he would find the answers. In addition to that, he probably would also want to adopt the, the motto of the Singaporeans who believe that there must be meritocracy, pragmatism, and honesty in public office. I mean, these are things, these are, these are some of the soft issues that we need to find ways and means of explaining to our teeming uh, youth on the continent, who, by the way, are quite knowledgeable and know what to be done. I, I do not believe for once that they aren't, uh, the young people on the continent in Dondo. Not long ago, Nigeria had an explosion of uh, youth anger. And I think two weeks ago in Ghana, we had the same. And people were asking basic questions. Why is it costing me so much to make a phone call to the United States when across the border is cheaper, you know? And these are questions that I suspect once we, we come up with a litany of issues that we can research on and then share these ideas with a wider community, we would have started, the, 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 we started on the path of changing minds. And so um, all I'm saying is that we need an army of uh, interested, but as well as people who need to be competent, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you both anymore. So now it's time. I'm going to turn it over to the audience Q&A, and we've got questions flooding in. And in the audience, please upvote any questions you like the look of and add your own, either as yourself or anonymously, if you so wish. Ask any of the panelists uh, anything about the topic we're talking, or even myself, if you're really that inclined. Um, so, Douglas, I'll come to you first. Timothy Worrell asks, in a continent that has had more than its fair share of tyrants, what is your preferred model of governance for Africa? a pro-market leader who rules for life, for example, who gives Rwanda, or a full commitment to freedom and democracy, even if that leads to anti-free market governments? I think it's a dangerous illusion to believe that there's ever a benevolent dictator. I speak as someone who grew up in a country that was governed um, by Idi Amin and, and, and then Milton Obote. Um, look, ultimately you need democracy to temper the whims of rulers. And it may be that democracy is a very messy business and that one of the short-term prices you pay for having democracy is you end up electing interventionists and socialists and all sorts of mad and bad people. But fundamentally, 
you can't have a system of government that works long term unless it's democratic. But, and I would argue this, um, you, you need, I think in Africa in particular, systems of governance that are decentralized. I think one of the great tragedies of Uganda is that prior to um, Britain giving it independence, there was an attempt to centralize the states. There was a dreadful British governor called Sir Andrew Cohen who centralized control and created what had been almost a federation of states into a unified state. That meant that you had a winner takes all system and the price of not having your person controlling the government was very high. And so you had a, a, a very brutal power struggle between competing factions and groups for control of the state. Over the past 20 years, Uganda has decentralized. It's restored the traditional monarchies. Power has been devolved to some extent outward and downwards to the counties. And I think this is linked to the political stability you get in Uganda. I, I would advocate that many of those countries which are artificial constructs as a consequence of decisions made by cartographers at the Conference of Berlin in 1884, many of those countries would benefit from decentralizing control. If all of the power rests with the big government official in Kampala or Nairobi or, 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 or wherever it is, you, you create a, 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 an incentive for people to, 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 to try to seize power. If you decentralize control and you pass power outward and downward, I think you, you, you end up with happier, more united countries paradoxically. So I, I'm a strong believer in democracy. It's ultimately the only way you get a free market system. Paradoxically, it's the only long-term sustainable way to get a free market system. And, and China, I think, is rather, rather vividly about to demonstrate why a, 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 a tyranny can never ultimately uh, lead to a free market. But um, I would say that in terms of democratic governance, I think many Ugandan states need a healthy degree of decentralization, um, particularly those that are um, slightly eclectic ethnographic mixes as a consequence of arbitrary decisions made many generations ago. Abraham, do you agree with that? A decentralized uh, democracy is the way to go or is a strongman pro-free market leader uh, the ideal? Of course, Douglas put it right. There cannot be a benevolent dictator. Uh, I, I, sometimes I just uh, look, you know, look at my colleagues who are yeah, working in Rwanda with uh, Kagame, or I'm a big fan of what he's doing. And I just tell them, just just wait for it. Like, it cannot work forever like that. You, at some point, you need uh, people to actually have uh, freedoms that are not necessarily economic. And um, economic freedom itself cannot work in isolation. It needs other forms of freedom for it to, to blossom. Uh, but again, I just want to reiterate what Douglas said, that this idea of economic centralization or looking forward or towards the national government or the federal government for economic policies are actually alien to Africa. And many African historians or economic historians have pointed this out severally. Uh, from the earliest external accounts or outsiders accounts uh, that we have as historians of economic, you know, economics in Africa, from the times of Herodotus to individuals in the fourth century that wrote about trade in Africa. They wrote about some kind of people trading with people without barrier, people taking their wares from the Horn of Africa to, to the Middle East, to, 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 the Asia, to Asia Minor, whatnot. Majority of our, of our um, empires and kingdoms that attracted the, the British colonialists in the 16th uh, to, to 19th century where because these colonialists were attracted by the economic prosperity and uh, natural resources and endowments in these uh, um, villages and kingdoms. Even the king himself often have his own farm and his own entrepreneurial endeavor. So this so-called idea of looking towards the central government for economic planning or giving out handouts or you know, limiting how much or how far individuals can go in establishing their own business or trade with one another is actually alien. Uh, to the continent. But what the one thing I actually want to re reiterate again is, or actually, you know, bring up is, is that people often neglect the, the, uh, the impact that security or terrorism can have on the, uh, on the Africa continental free trade area or any other pro free trade agreement that, that, that is cross border. Because a lot of African leaders now uh, are using the excuse of insecurity, particularly uh, in the sub-Sahel region, 
for closing borders or for um, banning some items. Uh, of, I, I can imagine Nigeria's Muhammad Buhari at some point last two years said he had to close the border because uh, people were importing, you know, putting guns inside bags of rice being imported from Benin Republic or Ghana. And for that reason, he banned rice importation because, as we know, that he want to encourage local production or, en or empower the so-called rice farmers in the northern part of the country. So he used the, he used the uh, uh, excuse of terrorism or, or gun uh, or arms movement across the border as an excuse to do that. So now that we are seeing increased uh, insecurity problems across uh, Africa, I'm just scared that uh, a lot of African, African leaders, for instance, Nigeria, that didn't show that enthusiasm for the free trade agreement in the first place can eventually start using internal uh, economic policies to, to limit how far uh, these, these agreements can go. And again, we, we have to remember the continental free trade area goes as far as countries um, implement and uh, subject themselves to the dictates of the agreement itself. Yeah, and what you mentioned about uh, the pre-colonial uh, trade, is that a great argument that we should make then in favor of the free trade area, especially when we try and communicate it to others, it's undoing the legacy uh, of the barriers erected by the uh, colonial empire. Absolutely, as, as Douglas said, uh, like in the case of Uganda, where people have always been used uh, to, to, to free trade or trade across borders before uh, 1885 or 1884 uh, Berlin demarcation, hit the continent, we have to actually use that kind of argument uh, with uh, our Africans whenever we engage them, that our ancestors have flourished because of free trade. Idea, the idea of border closure, except for wartime, the idea of economic border closure or heavy tariffs or some other uh, embargoes are foreign to Africa. And this, of course, uh, started with Britain and France and Germany and Belgium. So we have to, the decolonization process does not only you know, limits to uh, policy decolonization or political decolonization, it comes down to basic economic decolonization. And in this case, uh, decolonizing how uh, we organize economic policies or economic structures. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, Douglas, I'm afraid, I think you're only here for 45 minutes, and that's correct. I'm going to have to go now, but um, thank you for inviting me and um, uh, Franklin, Ibrahim, I look forward to working with you. I, I, I'm sure this project is going to be a great success and I look forward to watching what, what you do with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Douglas. Thank you for being on our advisory council too. Okay. Bye-bye. So, uh, Franklin, coming to you next, we've got a question from our mutual friend, Chris Hattinger, who is a deputy director of the Free Market Foundation in South Africa. He asks, what practical steps can be taken to, to counter corrupt institutions and behavior that act in effect as a non-trade tariff barrier? More punitive measures? Uh, it will be very difficult to shake up dominant politicians and bigger businesses perceived to be their territory. I must admit, corruption has become like a, this amorphous entity, which uh, is very difficult to battle. But I think that, of course, punitive measures are very much uh, in, in order. Um, you know, once you make examples of the big fishes or the big fish, um, then everything falls in line. I must suggest, though, that the way to counter the, 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 the debilitating impact of corruption is also somehow to ensure some sort of performance uh, work with some performance indicators. I think somehow our public sector uh, is, is not set up for execution or for perfection. And so somehow people are not giving milestones to, to meet. And I think that in itself uh, instills some sort of diffidence in the way th uh, things are organized. So punitive measures are one, but I think we need to find a way of shining the sunlight and the ways the uh, the public sector is set up and, and, and the way it interacts with the private sector as well. But um, it's a difficult question and I, I do not intend suggesting that corruption can be dealt with almost immediately. Um, but indeed, punitive measures could certainly be a good way out. Thanks, Franklin. Um, and Ibrahim, to you next. I've got a question from an anonymous attendee. 
it's quite interesting one. It says, which of the African lions is most likely to become the engine of growth and innovation in the continent in the next 10 years? Which of the African what? Lions, he calls them. How many lions do we have in Africa? Well, <laughs> of course, people will ordinarily say you have to look towards the likes of Nigeria or, or South Africa. But, you know, this, this agreement itself, this free trade area agreement, has the potential of turning the tide for a lot of countries. Uh, countries like Congo, uh, which has immense natural resources, things to trade with the world, in fact, things to trade with the rest of Africa. Uh, it, it has the potential of making the Democratic Republic of Congo as the economic powerhouse of, of Africa in the next, uh, what, 20 years? Uh, but again, as I said earlier, everything comes down to how far we implement this. And I think one of the reasons why the IATP is coming at a crucial time is because uh, not only do we need to, as, as you know, civil society, need to pressure African governments or presidents uh, or parliaments to keep uh, up to upholding their promises in the, in the, in the Africa Constitutional Free Trade Area, but also uh, ensuring that we encourage electorates to put pressure on their representatives as well. And there is no better way to do that uh, except through the civil society itself. So it's all come back to the civil society. So it's a great uh, in, uh, addition to uh, the push for uh, free trade in Africa because the AFCRTA in itself doesn't really bring about any free trade. What actually brings about free trade or will uh, make these old promises or projections come to fruition is implementation and how far they keep track of the implementation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got a, I've got a very interesting question next, which I'll turn to Franklin uh, from Peter Lilly. And he makes the case about the geographical disadvantages that Africa has to trade. He says, isn't it important to recognize that Africa suffers from two kinds of barriers, natural as well as man-made? Geography has not been kind to Africa. Few navigable rivers spanning the continent, few natural ports, and as yet, few roads and railways. So investment in transport links is important. Of course, investment in those links will be more profitable if the man-made barriers are removed. So I guess the question is, from that, it, how do we get over the geographical disadvantages that Africa has been dealt? Obviously, there's some brilliant advantages Africa has been dealt, as you mentioned, uh, Ibrahim, in Congo, over amazing and plentiful uh, commodities they have there. But barriers to trade how do we get over that do you turn to the chinese government uh to ask for loans of to get them to help you build your railway from uh to mombasa what, how do you overcome that franklin well as people have said geography can be a case to development uh, i think the likes of paul collier has uh, disproved that to a large extent. There are other parts of the world that are landlocked but have been blessed with good leadership and visionary leadership. And so somehow the barrier to, um, if you like, geographical barriers have been enhanced because they have good neighbors, they have good uh, policies, and somehow they've managed to overcome this challenge. I, I suspect that Africa is on the path to, um, if you like, embedding in itself of these intractable or difficult um, geographical barriers. But the fact of the matter is that it requires a lot of investment. And if a leadership is as, is as good as it comes, um, you would attract the necessary investment. As we speak, Ghana obviously serves a landlord countries uh, like Burkina Faso and a number of the Sahelian countries through our ports. And I don't think we've had any problems per se. Um, as I suspect it also had to do with negotiations on what tariffs are, are to be charged. But much more important is the opening up of these, these areas to the other uh, parts of the world. And I suspect that the Chinese investment, uh, even though it comes with uh, hidden gifts and hidden ish problems, uh, is one way out of the is one way out of the challenge. But it's a difficult question to 
deal with, uh, I would say that good leadership would definitely over, over, overcome uh, some of these intractable problems. Oh, that's really interesting because, Ibrahim, do you agree with Franklin that uh, you did a documentary, which everyone can check out on YouTube, uh, was it called Does Africa Need China? Um, that base addresses this issue. But do you agree with Franklin that perhaps African countries should turn to Chinese loans in order to uh, help build their various infrastructural projects? I will say I, I do not really agree with that because not only does Africa has more than it's asking of China, uh, but also it's, it will be a big slap on a project like the AFCFTA. And this is why. So on the first one, Africa loses more to corruption annually than it does taking in form of um, foreign aid. So if we lose about $180 billion to corruption annually, and on the average, we get about $120 billion in, in loan annually. So why not fix corruption and through that generate more than enough you will need than you, than you will need uh, if you otherwise go for a loan. But also on the other side, we have to look at the you know things like internal political dynamics. So you have governments of Nana Kufuado or government of Buari uh, accepting or signing these, these trade agreements now or even if they want to go borrow money from China. So what if there is another regime that comes in the next four years and they do not agree with how uh, the Ghanaian government or the Nigerian government has been approaching the AFCFTA or free trade generally. So that means they will come with their own new policy that, one, that might not necessarily um, follow um, the dictates of the AFCFTA as agreed to by the previous government. So not only do we need to think about uh, looking inward, to raise the monies to fix our infrastructure deficit, but also uh, keeping in mind that the, this AFTA, ASFTA is only signed by these current leaders. Uh, we might see new leaders in the next four or five years. So the question is, how do we keep these leaders, the new leaders, to keep on uh, implementing the policies of their previous uh, leaders? Yeah, and I've just seen in the comments to the question that I asked about from the anonymous attendee, what uh, country will be the engine of growth and innovation? Linda Kavuka, who is our friend and also on the advisory council for the IATP2, uh, she says she thinks Ghana will, as, uh, will emerge as Africa's next hub. Um, and as well as that, she also asks, Franklin, I'll come to you for this one. How do we make African states respond to competition with protectionist policies, embraced, embrace trust and implement the free trade area? And maybe we'll have more time for one more question after this. Well, I guess it, competition is the name of the game. Look, a while ago, um, about two years ago, I led conversations between a think tank in Morocco, uh, business leaders in Morocco, entrepreneurs who had come to Accra to discuss how they can assess ECOWAS market, the economic community of West African states. And um, as you know, Morocco is very uh, interested in assessing the entire AFTA agreement, but they are trying to take advantage simply because Morocco has got the institutional arrangement policy-wise. There are low interest bearing loans in that country. Uh, the government somehow uh, supports the entrepreneurs. And so they have an opportunity to you know, venture into other fields. But if I look carefully at what obtains in Ghana, in terms of how SMEs survive, you can be borrowing at almost 30% and hope that you can compete with someone from Morocco, not even next door neighbor Nigeria, really. So I guess it's a combination of looking in what to look at the various policies that we ourselves have enacted or implemented and see how we are able to reform them in order to compete. It, it's the only way out really. I mean, otherwise, if you do not take care of your own, others will take care of, of, of for it, take, of, take over, and then take all the opportunities through the free trade area. Yeah. So, Abraham, what do you make of that as well? What uh, Linda's question, just to reiterate, was how do you make African states that respond to competition and protectionist policies, embrace trust and implement the uh, free trade area. 
I guess it's states is a difficult word because you have to deal with government on one page, uh, civil society, students, teachers, um, your everyday person who knows fairly little about the uh, policies around international trade law. Um, how do we get them to embrace and trust it? And I think this will be our final note. So try and make it a good one, Ibrahim. Right. So uh, I think uh, civil societies, think tanks particularly, and this applies to everybody involved in think tank uh, work. Uh, we need to really try as much as we can. I know we're doing a remarkable job at that, but we need to reinforce the efforts of simplifying our messages to the people that actually matters. In this case, the electorates. Uh, because the main, if you do your research, the main reason you will perhaps find uh, to that has been, you know, influential people to say they want protectionist policies, that they, they will prefer the Nigerian government to ban the importation of rice so that the northern farmers can uh, feed the country, is this, this fear that people are taking away what otherwise could have been pr pr uh, uh, created or sold in the country itself. And this, this is a very critical uh, paranoia among Africans from leadership to, to ordinary people. So if you go to the market in Lagos and you say, uh, well, the government is trying to uh, open the, the border to allow uh, sellers of, say, for instance, shea butter in Ghana, in Kumase, to bring their shea butter to, to Lagos market. Well, the Lagos marketers or uh, sellers will tell you that we have more than enough and we're not making more money from ours. So why should we then open uh, uh, the border for Ghanaian um, share butter sellers? Th that's when you have to actually make your case in a very simple manner. At this point, I do not think Africans truly, truly understand uh, the, the benefits of free trade itself. And ironically, this, this has been the reasons why our ancestors flourished. It's the only way for our future to be guaranteed. And I think the IATP is coming at a very important time to, to complement the efforts that have been made incredibly uh, by the likes of Franklin and Imani and the FMF in South Africa and the many, many, many um, friends we have across the continent. Because not only does our, does our future in the next uh, 20 to 50 years, as you know, Africa's population is gonna surge, uh, lies in how, how better we implement economic policy, but also about how we relate with each other, not only in, in social terms, but also in economic terms. What an ending note. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for tonight. Uh, be sure to visit the IATP's brand new website at www.theiatp.org. Uh, also visit African Liberty and Imani Ghana's. Visit the IATP's Twitter page at the underscore IATP and our Facebook page, which is just the Initiative for African Trade and Prosperity. And you'll stay up to date with our latest content. We regularly will update our articles and so make sure you follow us to keep posted. And soon, in the next couple of days, we'll be publishing a brilliant long essay by Steve Davies about the history of African trade and how the free trade area fits into that. And that's definitely something you won't want to miss. Uh, similarly, be sure to subscribe to the IA London YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon below. I've always wanted to do that. Uh, to stay up to date with the latest IA videos. And finally, thank you so much for all of you watching at home. A special thanks goes out to all of our donors who make projects like the IATP and events like this possible. If you were interested in making a donation to the IATP or the IEA, uh, whichever, it's okay. And uh, no matter how big or small, please visit our website to find out more. So thank you to James Tooley for his opening remarks and our panelists, Douglas Carswell, Ibrahim Anoba and Franklin Kujo. Over and out. Good night, everyone. Good night.